Hey everybody, welcome to the Hit or Die podcast, episode 69. We're here with your hosts, Jake Saldati and Chad Rothford. Um, and we have an ex-Bulldog here, Steve Sesdorf. Steve, thanks for uh, joining the show with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, real quick, you're from... Uh, Newhall. Newhall, California. And uh, went to Hart High School. And then you were a four-year letterman at Fresno State uh, with the career stats of a 331 batting average and... 39 homers, 69 doubles, and 218 RBIs, which is a lot of RBIs. Is That's that the a, is that the record? Yeah, I have a record on a few things. I, 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 I know RBIs, I, I, I think, yeah, and doubles. I'd have to go back and check. 69 doubles. But, but yeah. And you were all Nobody academic. Nobody better be beating that. No, I, you were all academic <laughs> too, right, for all – Four years. Well, yeah, he's he wanted to be. He a, was civil engineer. I read also. He wanted to be a smart guy, so he had. To go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I, uh, I I got academic all American my senior year. That's something that I really, really wanted, really strive for. Um, but but it took me to my senior year to get it. I was I think I was academic all whack all the other years, but really wanted academic all American. Yeah, and uh, yeah. We know later on that uh, we know your mom wanted academic all American as well, but that will come later on in the story. <laughs> we'll talk about, we'll talk about it later. Um, yeah, I knew you said, yeah, I think 218 RBIs, which is cr- you would have thought Amadi would have caught you with having like almost a hundred that, uh, yeah, one he had 99, right? <clears> oh, <throat> eight, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, that's not that, yeah, I, I, yeah, that has to be up there in the tops. That's well, I season. think I think that might um, be the top for a season in Fresno State. Who was it? Somebody else that know. year had yeah. a shit ton of RBIs. No, it was, he was he was second because Posey, right? That's right. Posey think, had a hundred. Uh, yeah, Posey yeah, ended yeah. with a hundred, and Amadi had ninety nine. Because I remember during our episode, they were like, uh, Mendonca <laughs> needed. Either one, one more, more strikeout, strikeout for 100, yeah. or, or he needed four strikeouts for 100, and then he needed two home runs for 20, right? I think. Selfish. Yeah. Selfish. <laughs> and then Amadi, Amadi was like, he, maybe he was like four or five RBIs. Four or five He RBIs was close, away. but still, that's a, I mean, nobody even sniffs, nobody even sniffs yours. Was 60? 88. Was it 88? 88. I mean, nobody even yeah. gets to like the 60s. Not anymore. You're not seeing guys yeah, break know. 60 ribs. I was always thinking because since we played, you know, the most games you could play and lost the most elimination games you could possibly lose. We had, I was like thinking we had the most at bats, you know what I mean? Yeah. And we had the, you know, the, the orange stealth composite bats. So I was like, no one's ever going to beat these records. <laughs> no. But I mean, guys still aren't even hitting 300. No, God, I was, well, I was right there. With, I was right there with you junior year thinking draft and stuff and it didn't happen. I just yeah. Yeah. The, the worst thing about. is when you see guys there, you're like, <laughs> well, what? and you know what? You played well on TV that year. No, but it, the draft was before. Was it before your regionals? It wasn't no, the, the same time. The supers. Yeah, no, my junior year I didn't get drafted. Yeah, and it, the draft was during regionals. It's always you guys during were, regionals. that was the one you were like an out away from Omaha. No, that we won the regional. It's during regionals, not super. It's, it wasn't super because yeah. theirs was during. No, theirs was during regionals too. It was, it was, a, was it? Oh no, that supers. Was super. That was supers. Yeah, yours was during supers. Did your supers? Yeah, so I, my. Yep. Yeah, ours. Yeah, we was, super ours was the. Uh, it was like the week in between because I remember we had the regional, and then I was like, "Oh, I'm getting drafted for sure." I was the regional MVP, and then I hit three thirty one with thirteen and. I think almost 70, oh my gosh. Almost 70 ribbies and I didn't get drafted. And, and I'm like, we're, we're going to Clemson for the Supers. And I'm like, dude, yeah, I'm going to prove them wrong. And that, you know, we almost won out away from the call. <laughs> but you got to send him that. He said he hit, I don't know if we've talked about it on the show. He hit a ball at Clemson and I didn't really know him. I didn't know him then. This might be one of the farthest balls I've ever seen. It was the farthest ball I've ever hit. But we had, uh, uh, it was my junior year. So it would have been your, it was 06, so it would have been your sophomore year, where they had the the gray composite with the red middle or the orangest red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was just yeah, like yeah. the orange one. Yeah. Kind of. We we got those because we we're a low D1, so we didn't get those till regionals. 
and Easton sent us two, only two bats. <laughs> only two. So our whole, team, our whole team was using the same bat. Yeah, that was ridiculous. So here comes Oral Roberts freaking – we sweep the regional and we go to Clemson and we got, we got two bats, two team bats that we're using. It was just ridiculous. And then the next year – And those were so – Oh, those were so good, weren't they? So good. Oh my gosh, we got to demo those bats. By the way, my sophomore year, my sophomore year, they were they were still testing them out. They brought them out to VP, and every ball that I'm hitting is going off the weight room or on the weight room, and I'm like, this thing is great. Like, let me get some of that. And they're like, coming coming to you next year. Yeah. No, and then yeah and then you were still using the orange one your senior year because that was 07 when the orange one came out those were negative what three they were negative three so yeah. when i played we had negative fives no you didn't yeah no all it no, must have changed when i got to my senior year because when i was my in, freshman year what year it went to negative three i graduated in 01 and i had an air attack that was a minus five no, because I was 03 in my freshman year, so it would have been 99. And I don't remember. my. So our bat was, was the red line. Yeah, the red line C-Core. Your brother probably my knows. Brother put my my oh, brother, yeah. red line extended negative yes. five. Yes, they were negative fives. Yeah. I, I had both of them. I actually had one. That thing's like a $1,000 bat one. now. I'm not joking. What? Go on eBay. They're like six, dude, seven bucks. Dude. So listen to this. So. Why I find one in the storage shed, and I'm like, I'm bringing this thing to the alumni game, this last alumni game. I'm like, I'm gonna bring it, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna beat the beat the Bulldogs. We're, we're gonna cheat. I don't care. We're gonna win. <laughs> and so, so, so I go in the cage, and I'm like hitting. I'm like, I need a. I haven't hit a baseball in you know a year since the last alumni game. I better go figure out how to hit. So my dad's feeding me balls, and I'm hitting off the machine. And I'm hitting with a wood bat, and I was like, okay, let's, like, do one bucket with this thing just so I see what it feels like. And, and like, ten balls in, I hit one ball, and the bat just cracked, massive crack down the middle. And I was like, no! Yeah, they're pricey now. Well, I mean, it's almost freaking 20 years old, you know? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're expensive on eBay. So let's get right into it. I'll go back to Hart High School and, uh, and the recruiting process and uh, take us through it. We would hit, we would hit in the batting cage pretty much, pretty much every day for about 45 minutes a day. Me and uh, my older brother and my younger brother. I don't know how my dad pulled it off, to be honest. Um, but, but anyway, yeah, we we would hit every day with exception to Christmas Day and the month of August. Um, and and with that, uh, we all produced pretty well growing up. Um, me specifically, I kind of struggled a little bit more. Uh, I had a uh, I had some, some mechanical issues with my swing uh, leading into high school. And uh, my sophomore year, uh, I was on the junior varsity team and didn't really put up too great of numbers. And my older brother was was super good high school player, so I had a lot to live up to, um, it, but, but had a lot of mechanical issues and uh, got a hold of a really good hitting coach. Um, my brother was at UCLA and they sent all of their hitters to uh, Craig Wallenbrock and uh, Brent Brown over at the ball yard in Chatsworth. And uh, I got to go over there and hit. Um, and after my first hitting lesson, it was, uh, it was right before my junior year. It was uh, the summer before my junior year is when I went and had that first hitting lesson. And did some video analysis and, and went out in the game right after. And I, I hit the first home run I ever hit in my life, actually. Um, and it was crazy. I mean, you'd think, you know, I'm sure you guys hit homers in Little League and things like that. But but I didn't. Um, I kind of developed a little bit later. And, uh, and then just kind of spent my junior year and my senior year working with uh, mostly Brant. Brant Brown, I don't know if you guys know him. He's former yeah. Fresno State. Uh, baseball player. He's a Dodgers hitting coach right now. Um, but anyway, I uh, worked with him my junior and senior year and, uh, and then uh, got, ended up getting recruited by Fresno State my senior year. Going to uh, you know, the recruiting process, was Fresno State the, the only school after you? Um, did you hit your stride late in high school? Or was there you know, not too many guys after you? Or was that connection with Brent Brown also helped out? 
You know, yeah, the connection with Brant, I don't think is what did it. Um, and yeah, I, I, I did blossom late in high school. Um, so I remember, you know, like I said, my brother was, you know, a really good high school baseball player, went to UCLA, was drafted in the sixth round. Um, so I, I wanted to be a division one baseball player too. And, uh, I remember probably about two weeks before early signing ended, I was playing scout ball and I went out to a scout ball game at Moore Park junior college and, and had the game, like had the batting practice of my life, had the game of my life. And Tim Montez was there and uh it completely like played out of my shoes I had a couple doubles hit a bunch of homers and bp which was not typical for me with a wood bat um and it was almost like you know i was meant to go to fresno state i always liked to think you know god had a god had a plan for me and uh fresno state was a place for me and uh after that game I came home and I told my dad, you know, I think I think I might have a chance to get a scholarship to Fresno State. And he was like, nah, we'll see. You know, like he didn't really believe me much. <laughs> he wasn't at the game. But anyway, uh, sure enough, that next week I got a call and uh, got a visit. And probably the last that was the last week of early signing my senior year. Um, Went out to Fresno State, met Coach Basil, Basil with uh, with my dad, and got a small scholarship offer, and uh, and then took the week to kind of think about it. Um, I was a big academic guy, and uh, I was pursuing schools like UC Santa Barbara, UC San Diego, um, and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. I was I wanted to get a degree in civil engineering and those were top top of the line schools in california so when i got the scholarship offered to fresno state um not not the biggest academic school and uh i was a little torn on you know do i want to go there um or do i want to pursue you know my civil engineering degree but i really wanted to play division one baseball and uh I remember I was torn for like a week, man, like thinking about it. Should I sign? Should I not? My mom was like, you, you shouldn't sign, you know, like you should, you should go to one of these schools. You work so hard. And, uh, by the way, my mom loves Fresno state now. Uh, but at the time I remember, I remember she was like, you've worked so hard, you know, in school to get your GPA where it needs to be to get into these schools. You know, you might, you're going to throw it all away. Um, and it, it ended up being the best decision I ever made. I'm so happy I, I chose to go to Fresno State. The four years there were some of the best years of my life, for sure. Um, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, your mom. I mean, and I can <laughs> be torn with that. Because that, that might be, you know, a lot of outsiders maybe think that of the Fresno area. I, I mean, people I talk to, especially like I've got friends and other states and they're like oh fresno and it's you know they have this perception it's almost like oakland raider fans you know um what was it that you, you know yeah uh, no go ahead yeah no yeah you know we in valencia you know i didn't know much about fresno to be honest um and it wasn't like a, like a it's a bad place at all you know it was just it was just from an academic standpoint you know, I, I probably wouldn't have had to try as hard as I tried in my in my to get my grades up and end up going to Fresno State. I could have got in um, with with a lower GPA. That's what it came down to with <laughs> with my mom. But uh, but anyway, like I said, she loves Fresno State, and and my sister ended up going to Fresno State too and playing tennis out there for the Bulldogs. But we as a family, like we are, we're huge Fresno State fans. And, and, I didn't really know the program, you know, what it was all about. And when I went out there on my recruiting trip and I saw the facility, and I, I saw I saw everything. I'm like, this is amazing. Like, this is how many people show up to the games. Like, it is it's it, it is unlike anything else. You know, my, my brother went to UCLA and I went to those games out there. And, I mean, 100 people show up to those games. And when I was at Fresno State, I mean, we would get – we would get a thousand people. We we would even get up to four or five thousand people if we had a a Stanford in town or something like that. So way different, way different atmosphere. 
So what was the, what made, what made you decide finally to choose Fresno state? Like what was, what was the deciding factor? I, I wanted to play division one baseball, you know, like <clears throat> I'm going through, you know, trying to, to live up to everything my brother, my older brother did. He was such a good player. You know, I, I wanted to be that. I wanted to be a good division one baseball player. And, and that was my opportunity. So I, I, I didn't know much out, you know, outside of that, um, aside from seeing the program, uh, Ryan Haig was going to school there and he was a formal, former, former uh, hard high guy. Um, so I was familiar with him and his family and he had nothing but good things to say about the program and coach Batesel. Um, so that was enough for me. Talk about, um, you know, your time at, at Fresno state when you first got there, and, um, how much Bates all helped you. I know he's a big hitting guy and, and obviously you love hitting, um, you know, just learning his philosophy and, and, uh, and buying into the, the program. Yeah. So my first batting practice there was pretty funny. It's a pretty funny story. So I got <clears throat> Brian Lappin in my group and Jared Halpert and Ozzie Lewis. And if anyone doesn't know those three people, Lappin's, you know, 6'5", 225. And Halpert's 6'3", 6'4", 220. And Ozzie Lewis was a freshman with me, but he was 6'3", 6'4". He's a big boy. So we're out there taking batting practice and Lappin's launching balls off the scoreboard and Halpert's launching balls off the weight room and Ozzy's hitting plenty of home runs too. And I was this six foot one, 175 pound freshman, you know, skinny, skinny freshman. And I'm just hitting line drives, you know, line drives. I, I tried to put a few balls out, but the field at Fresno state was way bigger than hard high at, at hard high. It was, 310 down the line so I, I couldn't put any balls out <laughs> and I walked off that field at the end of that first practice and I called my dad and I was like I, I don't know if I'm ever going to play here man you know like I don't know if I'm ever going to start um, these people out here are grown men and I'm just a little boy <laughs> and, uh, and my dad was like you know I don't, I don't think you're going to play your freshman year anyway. So don't worry about it. Just go out there and have fun. <laughs> it was great, man. It was great. But no, I, I learned a ton from coach Batel when I was there. Um, kind of like I was talking about, I, I had, I got to work with Brant a lot before I went out there and we did so much video analysis and worked on the mechanics uh, of my swing, my upper half specifically and really got a good, efficient path to the ball, uh, staying in the zone a long time. Um, but one thing I didn't have was how to, how to analyze a pitcher and, and know what they're going to throw you or start to predict what they're going to throw you and, and get out of the whole mechanical mindset. I mean, I, when I was in high school, I'd be up at the plate thinking about, you know, what am I doing with my hands and what am I going to do with my back elbow and while I was hitting. You know what I mean? And you can't do that. If you're, if you're up there thinking about mechanics, you're ruined. You know, it's game over. You're, you're not going to hit. And, uh, and Batesel, Batesel got me out of that mindset and just got me focusing on the pitcher. Um, it would talk about his plan A plan of hitting the fastball, <clears throat> which ended up being tailored great for me. Um, growing up, hitting in the batting cage every day, we would ramp our machine up to – it was set up like – 45 feet away and uh we would ramp it up to 9,500 miles an hour and, and would hit we would hit a, a bucket at that speed every single day um and so velocity was no issue for me for the most part I could hit a fastball but I didn't ever had that plan of, of focusing on it and when I got to Fresno State and Batesel kind of showed me the numbers of like hey you know you want to hit 450 less than two strikes, you know, here are the college numbers. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. And so I just committed to that plan as a freshman and, uh, and it really worked out to just trying to hit the fastball. And then I learned so much, um, during games, we would, uh, he would get all of the left-handed hitters together and get us to focus, you know, watch each other, watch each other's at bats because, 
how he's going to pitch me is probably a lot how he's going to pitch Ryan Overland or Tom and et cetera, et cetera. So all of the lefties, you know, when there was another left-handed hitter up, I'd be watching them. I'd be like, what's his out pitch? Well, you know, what's he throwing when he's getting ahead? What's he throwing when he's getting behind? And uh, when I got up to the plate, I had a plan and, uh, you know, I, I knew their tendencies and, and I could sit certain counts. And it was huge. It was huge learning that from Basil. Before you got there, even in, like in high school, were you a guy that watched a lot? You watched a lot of baseball? Not at all. Not at all. Yeah, I was, I was, I was thinking about my mechanics. I was never focused on the pitcher. I would go, I would just I'd go up and hit and I, I would look, look for a pitch and try to hit it. I wouldn't, I mean, I would try to hit a fastball, but I'd try to hit every ball. You know what I mean? Like I didn't have, I didn't have much of a plan and I definitely was not analyzing the pitcher or paying attention when I was sitting on the bench. What were some specific things that you guys would do, you know, for midweek and, and <clears throat> what were practices like and, and just what was the everyday Fresno? Cause we haven't really talked about that with anybody like day to day at state. If you know, you had finished up on a Tuesday night game, you know, what was Wednesday and Thursday like before you had a home series against a, you know, whoever, Stanford or, or uh, Hawaii or, or somebody like that? You know, usually Batesville would have some kind of practice plan tailored to whoever we were playing. Uh, if there were certain weaknesses that we had, uh, we'd be focusing on those. Uh, you know, but we did a lot of a lot of situational stuff uh, leading up to uh, upcoming games. Um, I can't really think of anything specifically, though. Um, for the most part, it was just it was just your kind of typical, you know, practice plan for the most part that that, that he would put together. Um, as an outfielder, I spent a lot of time. Outfielders have tons of time to hit, which was great. You know, a lot of the infielders would be doing doing ground balls, and 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 we would do you know some of our outfield work too. But there was significant time that that we had of downtime that we would just be in the cage hitting, which was great. And what did you take away from, I mean, how much, you know, obviously you were part of that 08 run. What did the, the classes before you, and I think we talked about this a little bit in your, the last episode you were in, but um, to refresh, like, you know, being a freshman and sophomore, and I know there were some pretty good classes prior to that 08 team and going to some regionals, you know, what personally did you take away from, from having those experiences and moments uh, you know, going to Fullerton. I forget where the other one was at. Yeah, a lot. And we did have great teams. I was just kind of thinking about it. Uh, my freshman year, I I think I finished it in like 280 with no home runs um, and was a smaller guy. And uh, that summer, I went out to Santa Barbara and spent um, the summer out there playing for uh, Santa Barbara Foresters. And uh, worked with a hitting coach out there, um, focusing on getting more weight on my backside and spent a ton of time in the weight room, um, working out sometimes twice a day, um, just trying to eat as much food as I can and, and put on as much weight as I can. And then came back my sophomore year um, and was with that group of guys on that my sophomore year team I mean we were unreal you guys have already talked about it but I mean we we had Bo Mills and Christian Vitters Nick Moresi and and in that lineup you know I was I got to lead off which is which is amazing right because they don't you know they don't want to pitch to those guys they wanted to pitch to me <laughs> so I saw so many fastballs it was great um it was it was it was actually easy to hit in you know now that you think about it um, my junior year was a little bit different. Um, you know, we less, less, uh, we didn't have, we didn't have Bo Mills, Christian Bitters, Nick Moresi. Um, I had Lappin hitting with me, which was great. Um, but, but it was different hitting in the middle of the lineup. I saw a lot more off speed. So I went through a period there and kind of struggled early on in the season. Um, going into my junior year, I was, uh, I was, I was, you know, coming off of a really good season. A lot of scouts were interested. Um, and I got really caught up in, 
in getting drafted. And I went out, you know, during batting practice and brought my wood bat out and was like, yeah, oh, watch me hit with my wood bat, you know, like before games, you know, before college games, I'm sitting out there hitting for the scouts, you know, and uh, my first 20 games, I might have been hitting 220. It was brutal. Um, and I got to a point we were, we weren't winning. I wasn't hitting and I got to a point where I was pretty much like, you know, might as well take these wood bats and throw them in the trash, you know, because scouts don't want me now and, uh, pick up my metal bat and just go play college baseball. And once I figured that out and just tried to enjoy college baseball and not worry about the next level, started hitting started hitting we started winning and we ended up having a great great season that year and went to Fullerton and you know lost again at Fullerton which was a bummer um but but really learned a lot that year I learned a lot about not looking to the next step just be where you're at enjoy the level you're playing at and don't get concerned with all the hype and I think a lot of people kind of lose track of that especially around the draft. There's so much hype around the draft, you know, a lot of college players get mixed up in that. Do you guys see that at all? Yeah, I do. I mean, even in a lot of where we're at though, we kind of get more caught up with these high school kids caught up in the, the D one scholarships. You know, they're, they're looking towards that. That's like their draft kind of, you know, they're looking towards that rather than concentrating on their high school season, you know, yeah, it, it's stressful as a high school player. I remember that because, I mean, you know, older brother went to UCLA, you know, older brother was CIF player of the year, and we're getting to the end of early signing, and, and I don't have an offer. You know, I was I was stressing out. Like, I'm not good enough. Uh, it's, it's a stressful time. But you, when you – biggest thing I could preach is just, just enjoy the stage of baseball that you're at. And – you start worrying about the next level, the next, the next step, and you're, you're going you're gonna to underperform where you're at. And you're not going to enjoy where you're at. I mean, even through the minors, um, it's so easy to look at them. I want to play at the next level. I want to play at the next level. Um, but, you know, half the, you know, the best part of it, best part of getting to the big leagues was the ride, the ride there and just enjoy the ride there, you know. Um, we'll go back just a little bit. Going into after your junior year, you know, you didn't get drafted. Going into your senior year, did you kind of just take that mindset of what you're talking about, just having fun? <clears throat> In my senior year, I'm just going to have fun and go out and play baseball and, and just let the cards fall where they may. Yeah, yeah. Junior year, um, I, it was – the draft was the frust most frustrating process for me, man. Um, I, I thought, you know, with the numbers that I had put up my sophomore year and my junior year, I was, I was hoping to get drafted in like the fifth to the seventh round. And if I would have been drafted there and gotten that money, I would have signed and never, you know, never thought twice about going back my senior year. And I communicated that to, to the scouts. So they were aware, like, don't waste your time on me. If, if I'm drafted past the seventh round, I'm not going to sign. Or if I don't get paid that amount of money, I'm not going to sign because it's not substantial money. And I care too much about school and I want my degree. And, uh, but I didn't think I wouldn't get drafted, right? <laughs> and so I'm sitting there watching the draft, and it's on the computer, and round five, round six, round seven, round 10, round 11, round 12. By the time we got to the 20th round, I took my laptop, and I closed it, threw it into a wall, <laughs> got in my truck, and started driving down a residential road about 65 miles an hour. I was heated I was like I mean I'm watching people get drafted that I'm like I mean my numbers were twice as good as yours like how are you getting drafted ahead of me and 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 I get it you know like the draft is about tools about projectability and and all of that and that wasn't me I was a guy that put up numbers I wasn't a guy that ran a six five sixty or you know projects into a ton of power um it's, it's I just it's not, it's, not, it's not about production, though. It doesn't make any sense to me. Especially when you're producing know, at dude. that level. I think, right? I, I, I couldn't 
I couldn't believe it. It was, it was frustrating, but, uh, but it was what it was, you know, it, 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 like I said earlier, it's like, to me, it was like God had a plan, right? Like if I would have been drafted in the fifth or seventh round, I wouldn't have thought twice. I would have signed and left. And, and I'm so happy I didn't, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, Cause I mean, and, and I, 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 ultimately you get, you got there, right? You, you didn't know that obviously then, but were there any conversations with, with coach Batesel after that or, or coach Ware or any of the staff during that, that process, once it finished to kind of, you know, use it as motivation or, or whatever. For sure. Yeah. Basil called me up and, uh, was like, this is, this is ridiculous. You know, the fact that you weren't drafted is embarrassing. And, uh, he's like, here's what we're going to do. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know, I was drafted in the 27th round, my junior year. Yeah. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to wear a number 27, your senior year, and you're going to throw it in every scout's face. And so that's what we did. He gave me number 27, which is, a, you know, in Fresno State history, like, that's a lucky jersey, man. Like, if you get blessed to wear number 27, you're going to have a good year. That's pretty much how it goes. Um, you know, Richie Robnett wore it. Bo Mills wore it. I wore it. And then look at all the guys after us that wore it. I, I mean, it, McGee, it's a luck. Casey McGee wore that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. McGee too. It, yeah. It's it's crazy. But yeah, he he did he didn't use that as motivation for sure. That's funny. I would never even have thought about that because to me, it's just you were 27. Like I didn't <laughs> think about. But it, yeah, I did see in your first you were number eight, right? Until yeah, yep, yep. I was number eight, and then I can't remember what happened to number eight, but. I want to say I wore nine my junior year. Like something happened. Like they, re- I don't know if they retired someone's number that was number eight. I can't remember. Oh. Um, but yeah, and then and then Batesel gave me twenty seven my senior year. Wow! And then you went off. I mean, yeah, that was. Uh, well, like, I mean, you went off. <laughs> well, and, and like junior. we talked about too, the last mm-hmm. time is is a lot of you guys, you know, with Headstrom and and uh, Amadi. I mean, you guys played like every inning that whole, I mean, Mendoza, that team, you guys stayed healthy. It was like everything kind of aligned. I mean, maybe it may be not the record overall, but a lot of things happened to, to make that all go. And, and uh, it's still so much fun to watch when they post those games. Yeah, man, I just that, that, that those were the best baseball times of my life by far I tell everybody that whole experience is way better than the big leagues you know like what we did out there was such a cool team accomplishment and and it you know you're right everybody everybody was able to play that long you know funny story is not everybody was healthy you know like I bet Mendoza well and Detweiler Mendoza what Yep, Detweiler wasn't healthy. Mendoza got hurt in a regional and played through it. I don't know if anybody knew. Um, I ended up having hip surgery after my first professional season, but I had all sorts of hip problems my senior year. And at the end of games, I had I had something uh, tendon in my in my hip was was rubbing like a bone was rubbing on it every time I would swing. And and if I could just keep it loose and warm and not sit down during a game, I could I could it would it would be fine. But the moment I sat down and cooled off, it would just like inflame like crazy, and I would limp out of every single game. Just like I couldn't even walk that great walking out of games. And, and but you know I was able to play through it. You know worked with a, a, a physical therapist to kind of like get certain stretches to be able to play through it and played through it my senior year and then played through it my first season of pro ball and then ended up getting hip surgery the following off season. (laughs) Yeah. Get it. Why get it? Why somebody else pays for it. That's true. Yeah. Well, I didn't even, I didn't know. I (laughs) I don't remember hearing Tom being hurt either. Yeah. Wasn't his, uh, yeah. Hit a finger or something. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this throwing finger does ring a bell. I think he was throwing, he was throwing the baseball with like just the three fingers, right? He like, didn't it wasn't his ring finger or something. I don't know. I can't remember what finger it was, but yeah, I, I want to say he like jumped up for a ball and then came down and and then dislocated his finger and then yeah, was playing through that too. But crazy, yeah, that 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 team was 
that team was special, man. It was, I mean, if you think about it, like when we went into the postseason and the one high draft pick we had was Tanner Shepherds and he got hurt, you know, it was reminding me of what happened my sophomore year. You know, my sophomore year, you know, we had this loaded team and we lost Bo Mills right before I think the WAC tournament. And then we lost Christian Vitters right before the regional. So our three, four hitters were gone, you know? And so my senior year, you know, we lose our, our, you know, Tanner Shepard's first round draft pick, you know, like crazy. And then after that was Wilson, I think was the next draft pick in the fifth round or something like that. <clears throat> but that team, you know, like we just, we all got hot. We all got hot right before, probably right before the WAC tournament. Um, you know, we didn't start off great. We were supposed to start off great. We didn't like every other year that I was there. <laughs> we always started off bad. Oh, man. Yeah. I don't, it, I don't know what the deal was, you know, we just, uh, we just like took, took us a while to get all the, you know, the jitters out. Um, but, but got hot, you know, got hot right before the tournament. Going to, you know, getting drafted and uh, just that different mindset of playing professional baseball. Yeah. Um, so drafted by the Phillies, which, you know, I don't think I could have asked for a better fit in an organization. Um, they were, they were big into hard work. Um, we would, we would condition more than I feel like other organizations. One spring training, I actually, uh, I lived with one of my, one of my buddies with the Phillies organization was Vance Worley. And we, he went to Long Beach state and, uh, Andrew Liebel went to, went to uh, Long Beach state as well. And he was pitching for the blue Jays. And we were, so we were living together all together in a condo in spring training. And, uh, I would come home like two hours later than he always would. And he'd be sitting out at the pool, have, you know, hanging out. And he'd go, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, oh, you know, just running us into the ground over there. Um, but that was, that was the Phillies. And, you know, for a guy that, you know, hit in the cage as much as I did growing up, it was a good fit. It was a good fit because, you know, you, you stick around. You're the first one there, the last one to leave. That's That's how you – you rise to the top in an organization like that. So I, so I drafted, you know, when, uh, went into pro ball, um, did you still have coming a off the college world here? You still have What's a chip up? on your shoulder, kind of ninth round, you know, putting up those numbers three years. Uh, and, uh, you know, 19th round, but not, you know, not really. Yeah. It, it, as a senior, you're not going to get paid anyway, right? So it doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> so no, I, I don't think I had. I mean, I was. I when when the draft happened in Arizona State, when I we were in the super regional when uh, when the draft was going on, I was pretty angry then, you know. But but after that, you know, we you know had the won the super regional, won the College World Series. I'd forgotten about all that. Um, but uh went out to Williams Park in uh, uh Pennsylvania and and started short season ball out there and uh it was so lucky to come off of a you know college world series win like there was there was more uh interest i think like the coaches you know like even though i wasn't a high draft pick that meant a lot so when i showed up <clears throat> right into the starting lineup hitting third or fourth um and then I was I was lucky enough to hit a grand slam my first at bat. <laughs> and you know, it was like it was like, are you dreaming? You know, like College World Series, Grand Slam, like it was on cloud nine. It was crazy. Um but but was that that really helped, you know, being a part of the College World Series. I was I was in the lineup for the whole season and I I didn't really have to fight for playing time, which was great. Yeah, short se short season is actually pretty fun. It was I remember going to short season. It's a because you're with all the college guys, you know, you, you're with all the college guys, so the stories continue and um, you kind of go through that pro process together, you know. Yeah, where did you play short season ball at? I was in Salem Kaiser, Oregon. Okay, 
So it was gotcha. Like, yeah. I've been to that far of the East Coast where you were ever. Gotcha. Short season was great, wasn't it? Like it was it, you're exactly right. Like you had a lot of college guys and it's such a difference in college guy than a high school guy. Oh yeah. I found that out the next year. You remember that? Yeah. Crazy. The level of maturity is like night and day. It's crazy. Well, just the, and then you keep going up and the difference, you know, you're, you're on a team, right. That achieves something that every college baseball team in the country is set to achieve every year, uh, which requires every man on the roster to get done. And, and now you're in something that's like, no, uh, while well, we're teammates, I need you to do bad. And, and <laughs> I, I you know what I mean? I've got to tear it up. And it's, it's a, just a whole like mind. I don't, I don't want to say the F word, but it's, you know what I mean? It's it, it, yeah. a whole mess. <laughs> it is dude. Yeah. You, you'll, you'll just step all over people to get to the next level and, and pro ball. You know, what was really funny was, uh, when I was at Fresno State, we uh, we we would go on road trips and stay at Courtyard Marriotts, you know. And then I got the short season. No more Courtyard Marriotts. You know, we're staying at like the the Days Inn was a typical one, but like you know Motel Six Days Inn. And I was like, you know, I thought getting into Pro Bowl was a step up. You know, like this is a huge step down. This is brutal. The, the, buses, the buses are worse. The 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 hotels are out yeah. of horror movies. You're just like I hear about that too. I get to hear about the locker rooms being a disaster. And and Andy Underwood always what he always tells us about his uni. I hear that uni story, and that was the one thing he said. Like, Pro ball is supposed to be this glorified thing, and he had pants that were like 12 years old that had no more patches left for holes. And uh it's a grind. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we would have Fresno State. We'd have booster club people, or our, our booster club would would show up with doghouse tri tip sandwiches before games sometimes, take care of us. You know what I ate? You know what I ate my first three years of Pro Bowl? I had two PB and Js every single day before every single game. And I had so many peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. It's crazy. <laughs> No, that was the that was the staple. Uh, two loaves of bread, peanut butter, and jelly. And yet, it depended on your clubby too, because some guys like grape jelly, some guys like strawberry. But you got to pay extra for that. It's 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 crazy. Yeah, I remember Donald. It's crazy. Tell, tell a story about uh, when he was in the minors and and they had no power. They had like seven guys and one like two bedroom apartment and. I don't know. It's uh, it's not what these what some of these kids think it's crack up to be. I don't know if it's better now. And obviously, the wage thing has been a huge topic the last couple of years for minor league baseball. Yeah, I am such a big college fan. Like, if there's one thing that I, I've had a I've had time, you know, plenty of time to go back to Hart High and talk to kids in high school. Um, but the one thing I always focus on is go to college, man, go to college and get that degree. You get drafted, they give you the, you know, $200,000, you know, $200,000 does not go very far after taxes, you know, it's $120,000 or whatever. It's not that much money, you know, like go and get your degree because not a lot of people make it to the big leagues. You get drafted, you know, it's still like a, 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 small handful that actually make it and it's not easy to make it you know like I was a senior sign I I fought for playing time every single year my path to the big leagues was so difficult you know most most every season usually went to this went the same once I got to double a I'd start the season on the bench and then halfway through the season the guy in front of me that's getting paid a million dollars isn't hitting and then I get to play, and then I, I hit well, and then I lead the team in hitting. And then the next year starts all over again. Start on the bench, the same guy starting, and it goes over and over and over again. And it is, it is such a fight to claw your way through that system, and, and hopefully you make it, right? But if you don't, then what? You know, at least, at least I had a degree to fall back on, and I had a job 
once I decided I was done playing baseball, I had a job within a month, you know, a good paying job and, and people lose sight of that. I, I had a, I had a really good friend uh, in pro ball. That was a high school guy and he got paid two or $300,000 and he played with me the majority of my career. So he was with the Phillies for five or six years and then he got released and he, you know, he had the deal where they'll pay for his college and he'd go back and pay for college, but he still needs to spend four years of his life to go get his degree, to get the job that I already have. You know what I mean? Right. So, I mean, the biggest thing I could, I could say to the high school players, you know, if you're not a first round draft pick and they're not giving you a million or $2 million, you should go to college and it's a really fun time. You know what? It's a lot more fun than pro ball. I'll tell you that right now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And it's, it's crazy that I haven't heard it that way before where it's like, you think about after out of high school playing pro ball. Yeah. But you could be 25 or 26, not make it to the big leagues and then have to get out. And now you're going to be 31, 32 graduating college. And I haven't started, you know, and that time a lot of people are married, have jobs, you know, doing that. And there are those lifer though, the minor league guys that, that do that and, and, and can get away with it. But just looking back and thinking about it now, like, yeah, the degree, <laughs> it makes more sense unless you are, cause you know, yeah. I do money matters, you know, money talks in pro ball. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. For high school guys. And then for college guys too, you know, you're in college and they're, you have a scholarship and they're paying you to to go play there. Get in class. You know what I mean? Get in class and, and know, and try to get your, try to make some progress towards a degree that, that, that always ate me up when I would see guys wasting, you know, either not going to school or taking classes that, you know, was, were never going to amount to a degree um and then get drafted and then it doesn't work out and then they go back to school and you know they're technically sophomores because they never really took class seriously and then they still have two and a half more years to get out you know like that <laughs> no like you know, let's, let's take it serious you know what i mean take it serious and and go to class and, and that's what Batesville kind of was all about you know well i think too like i know that scouts and <clears throat> are paid to look at you know projection and, and- you know, the guy's physical stature and, you know, you know, how hard they throw, how fast they run, all that. But I do bet they, they do say, you know, well, how's he – let's just see how he's doing in school real quick too. Let's see if there's, if there's a real work ethic behind this kid before we draft somebody. I was something we'd have to ask Labby, but, I mean, I'm sure it's not a huge determining factor, but if this kid's not working under a scholarship, how's he going to work under, a, you know – Eight hundred dollar a month wage, you know. We we burning spinning our wheels drafting this guy. They they should look at it. You're exactly right. Yeah, um, I I heard on a few of your guys' podcast, you guys are talking about how much extra effort you know you need to make to get to the big leagues. You know, some people are just physically gifted, right? And that takes you pretty far. For me, I I, I don't think I was in that category. I wasn't very physically gifted. I was just just got in the cage as a result of my dad and just hit all the time. Um, but not everybody does that. You know, some people they're physically gifted and it takes them so far, you know, maybe it takes them into the minors. Maybe they're, they're good enough to, you know, get to double a or whatever, but it doesn't take them the whole way. Um, that, that going to class and, and I think a scout should look at that. You know, I think that would tell a lot about somebody if they have good grades, they probably have a good work ethic. You know what I mean? Yeah, they're going to push themselves, you know, after game going 0 for 4, they're going to get in the cage <clears throat> and work on something or, you know, try to try to make adjustments. And Or is he okay with it? You know, is he okay with 1 for 4 with a bomb and, you know, leaving 10 guys on base? Yeah, for sure. That, for was, sure. A con- that was a conversation I heard on uh, – MLB tonight the other night and they were talking about Chris Davis. I don't know if you watched that and they were just like he was like he's two for twenty eight right now and they were like with two bombs probably. No, one was a double in the gap and I, I don't know. But they were just saying like does he he acts like it's not a big deal and I'm just trying to think like how would you that's what's weird about when I hear people 
who do the analysis stuff like unless you're you've been there like you know Harold Reynolds or somebody like but I think it was Am Singer was saying like does he even care and I'm like well, of course he I'm sure he cares he's you know he's gonna leave the game and have some of the worst years <laughs> in the history as a player yeah how would he not care yeah but they think because he's gonna make 23 million dollars this year that screw it who cares I, I don't know I just don't think that's the way those guys think Yeah, who knows? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> That's a real good question. That's what's going through their head. So you do get to the show, and we always love to hear the story of the call-up and, you know, getting to the ballpark and that first day and um, that, just everything. I think you were there for just over a week or so, and, and uh, let us have it, man. This is, like, one of my favorite things to hear. <laughs> all right um yeah so i was in triple a um i think we we're in rochester new york i think is what i remember but regardless um it was like 11 o'clock at night or something like that i was we were after the game getting ready to go to sleep in my boxers sitting in my bed and uh my manager oh no i was asleep i had actually fallen asleep and uh, my roommate was watching TV and my, uh, my manager, my hitting coach, my hitting coach, you know, he'd been with me. He was our hitting coordinator with the Phillies when I got drafted. And then he moved into just coaching in AAA as a hitting coach. So he had seen me from the beginning. And so he was like, I got to go. I want to see his face. So they walk in, they come into my, you know, hotel room and I'm passed out and they wake me up. And, uh, I mean, I'm like halfway awake and, and they tell me, you know, you're, you're going to the big leagues. You're going to pack up. You're going to St. Louis. Um, Phillies are out there and they need an outfielder. And <laughs> I was like, like, uh, I, what? Like, you know, I, am I awake or am I dreaming or like, you know, like no way. Um, and they're like, yeah, yeah, you're going to the big leagues. So I, oh my gosh, this is crazy. You know, heart starts pounding a little bit and uh, I go, I, I put on some clothes and walk downstairs in the lobby. Uh, Cause I'm like, I got to call my wife or got to call my wife. The first person I wanted to call and let her know. Um, and told her and uh, you know, that was, that was a super cool conversation. And then the next person I, 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 I called my parents and, and, and told my dad. And that was so cool. I mean, the, the man that had been in that batting cage every single day after work for an hour a day, not only with me, but my older brother and my younger brother every single day, except for Christmas Day and the month of August. I mean, he invested in me. You know what I mean? To call him and tell him, Dad, I'm going to the big leagues was the coolest thing in the world. It, it, was, it was amazing, man. And uh, anyway, after that, I went back up into my room, tried to go to sleep, didn't really sleep much, <laughs> packed up my stuff and uh, got on the plane and uh, went to St. Louis. And uh, <clears throat> I got off the plane and there was a chance that I might make the last batting practice group. So I got in that got in that cab and I was told the cab driver you got to get me there man like you got to get me there fast like I need it I want to hit batty practice let's go you know <laughs> whatever it takes and uh he got me out there and I walked in there and, and by the way you know you, you got to have a suit you know you're on the road you got to have a got to have a suit and uh I kind of forgot about that but uh, that morning I, I didn't have a suit we were on the road you know I had a suit it, at my in Pennsylvania but not in Rochester, New York. So I had the, I had the cab driver take me to it was like a Walmart. The only thing that was open that early in the morning was a Walmart or Target. I can't remember which one. So I went and bought like the most expensive suit you could buy at a Walmart or Target. That was like a hundred bucks. It was brutal. And I have, and I have like, I have a, you know, I have a few suits, you know, like I had something that I'm like, I'm going to wear this. I brought it to the East coast. I'm like, if I ever get called to the big league, I'm, I'm going to wear the suit. I'm going to look good. I walked into, walked into Bush stadium with a Walmart suit. <laughs> That's great. But I made, 
<laughs> but I made it. I made it by the last the, the last BP group. I took that suit off as fast as I can. Looked at my looked at my locker with with a jersey with my name on it, and just about almost started crying. Like, oh my gosh! Threw on my threw on my stuff, went out there, hit batting practice, and that was so much fun. I mean, big league baseballs are like bouncy balls, you know. Like, you put some backspin on it, and those things go. Um, so got to take got to hit got to hit some homers at a Bush Stadium, um, and then uh, went in and suited up for the game um and then i walked out i'll never forget this i, I walked out into the dugout i wasn't st- i wasn't starting i was just coming off the bench um but i walked out into the dugout uh into the dugout and i turned to the left and at cardinal stadium you turn to the left uh there's the dugout and then there's plexiglass and then there's a row of chairs that sit right there and I, I can't remember the guy's name with the Phillies that helped get my wife a seat sitting right there, but he's the best guy in the world. I, that's the first thing I saw when I walked on and I turned to the left. I saw my wife and she was crying and I was crying. And it was because she'd been she'd been with me through the thick and the thin, you know, where we uh, we started dating the summer of my freshman year in college. And funny story, uh, that summer, you know, I had one of the best summer ball, the summer ball experience of my life, you know, baseball wise, I hit 400, had four homers. And, and I, I always tell everybody at that point, I was like, she's a keeper, you know, yeah. <laughs> that girl, that girl's a keeper, you know, like <laughs> well, going through, I mean, pro balls a grind, I'm sure. I mean, but being no, like, he's talking about how good he did no i know he was dating you, yeah him. you can't no you can't ruin that you no know? no you you can't you know it's not broke you, you don't fix. mess you don't mess yeah. with good baseball but i'm saying like to be uh <laughs> to go through a pro you know season you know is tough you know to be a, a wife of a pro athlete is probably just as yeah. if not tougher uh so to share that so moment, dude is that's pretty sick man that's that's awesome yeah, she had been through she'd been through war with me those years. Um from when we got married in 2010 from there on out, she was over with me um during season. Um and it was it was so cool. It was so cool to share that with her. Um and then anyway, so um game went on. Lance Lynn was starting pitcher for the Cardinals and uh I was sitting in the dugout watching the game. And, and I'm watching this guy mow down our lineup with fastballs. And I'm sitting there watching, and I'm like, why can't anybody hit a fastball? Like, come on. Like, the guy's throwing fastballs. Let's go. Guys are in the and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, come on, you guys, you know. And, uh, and then, like, sixth inning, seventh inning rolls around, and the pitcher's spot's coming up. And Charlie Manuel looks over at me, and he was like, you're going to hit um if pitcher spot gets up you're gonna hit and and I wasn't like you'd think like your heart would be like pounding like crazy but it, for me it wasn't like I I was comfortable in the box I, I wasn't as comfortable on feet on the field in you know defensively but when I got in the box I was I was good and so I, I got got ready um ready to hit and got up there and uh I'll never forget when they, they announced my name, you know, they, they even, they announced now making his big league debut in St. Louis. Like you're not home, but, but everybody was cheering, man. That's cool. You know, <laughs> it was so, it was so cool. Yeah. I, I walked up and I was like, Oh, this is awesome. And, uh, first pitch fastball, but it wasn't a straight fastball. <laughs> it was a sinker. <laughs> And I found out why nobody was hitting him. And Lance Lynn has the dirtiest sinker. I mean, it's like a, it, it's almost like a left-handed curveball. You know what I mean? It just like, boom. And, and I took the first pitch and I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I've never seen a sinker like that in my life. Um, <laughs> and then ended up working the count and uh, ended up hitting a ball up the middle. It squared it up good. Uh, like a low line drive up the middle 
and he gloved it a little bit, <clears throat> and and it ricocheted to the second baseman, and they turn a double play. <laughs> and I squared it up and just, you know, hit, hit it right at him and double play. And so I'm running back to the dugout, just kind of like with my head down, like, dang, man, I didn't see it going like that. And there were fans, St. Louis Cardinals fans, standing on the dugout, like, get your head up, son. You made it to the big leagues, you know? St. Louis is amazing. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even have got that at Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Back to AAA. <laughs> was there any time? Uh, yeah. Was there any time to be starstruck when you got there that day? I mean, who was on that? I mean, was, he's, like, was Ryan probably, Howard there? Probably, and, did you go to big league camp and all like the year before or spring training? So you were around guys? Did or you no? already have that? I already kind of already had that moment with the Phillies guys. Um, so was, not there for me when I – when I was in minor league camp, Chase Utley came over to to talk about hitting one time. And that was so cool, man. I, I was a huge Chase Utley fan. Like when I was working with Brent Brown, we would pull hitter swings up and then side by side my swing. And we would like, you know, try to try to get my swing looking like theirs. And Chase Utley was one that we looked at all the time. So th- he was like one of my favorite players. And he came over to the minors and was talking about hitting. And I was like, uh, uh, hi, Chase. You know, I'm Steven. You know, <laughs> you so, know name. I, 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 yeah, I was so, so lame. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, it, I with the Phillies guys, I wasn't as as starstruck. The when we went to we went to Detroit, um, that was the second series, and uh, Miguel Cabrera and Prince Fielder were on that team. I was starstruck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I made sure I got a jersey signed by Miguel Cabrera, and I got a I got a ball signed by Prince Fielder. That yeah, that was that was. Uh, that yeah, that 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 series. Uh, That's pretty quick. The, guys, you, played, were, you were ready to go in there and get some stuff signed. <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't scared. You're like, let me bring in my bats. I'm gonna use this one today, but you can sign it still. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I went in there and uh you know it's so well, one of the one of the other young guys on the team uh they were sending stuff over and they were talking to the clubby and I'm like what are you doing? And they're like oh I'm going to go get a ball I'm going to have the clubby go over and get a ball signed by Prince Prince Fielder and I was like can you get me one too? You know like I don't know what this costs but like like he was sending over a jersey and I was like hey man I got a lot of meal money right now and I'm ready to spend it, you know. <laughs> He said, yeah, I'll get you a jersey. I'll get you a jersey and a ball. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Did they end up getting you uh, a Cabrera jersey? I got a Cabrera, a, a signed Cabrera jersey. And wow. then a signed Prince Fielder ball. That was super cool. That's cool that they just had yeah, and the, extra jerseys lying around. Cabrera jerseys. and Or did you get a signed on? Oh, I, I, they probably went up to the shop and bought it. Out and then I I paid the clubby you know I don't know four hundred bucks or whatever whatever it cost. Damn. Um, but yeah, the clubby was you know went and did that and and took care of me. It was great. What, yeah, that was. And 13? then yeah, thirteen. When did he win the triple crown? <clears throat> Just after that. I think fourteen. He won was the it triple 14? crown. Either way, that jersey's gonna be worth some money. Oh, he's a hall of famer. <laughs> that's, that's a good move, bud. It's a good investment. <laughs> <laughs> and then it won Detroit. You got your first start, which yeah, yeah, uh, resulted in your first hit. Yeah, yeah, I got a, uh, I got uh, Rick Porcello. Which, by the way, so so my first at bat was in St. Louis, and then I got to come in uh, when we were getting blown out. Um, and I got to, I got to face Max Scherzer. I think it was my second at bat. Lucky guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I didn't get a hit off of him. Um, I, uh, I was over to that game and then I got a start and I got my head off of Porcello. And I, the, we'll, uh, we'll show the video to people. It's on, you can go look at it, but your face when you got to second base, the, I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen it a handful of times. We'll just say that. Like, do you remember what was going through your mind when you finally got to the bag and, like, 
through the cheeser. And I think you were saying something to the shortstop, but just, do you remember that moment? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I think I heard, uh, I remember Jason Donald talking about getting his first hit right away. It's, it's so nice when you get up to a new level or get to the big leagues to get your first hit right away. And, and I had it. So like I was feeling serious pressure. And when I got that hit and I got the second base, it was such a, like, like, like that was going on. And then, Oh my God, I, I got a hit in the big leagues. <laughs> and that's in the books, dude, it's in the books. It's a done deal Yeah, forever. Did your brother do that? <laughs> you got <laughs> no. Yeah, he uh, he only got played the high A, and uh, that was the end of his career. <laughs> so, so you got that. Yeah. You got the World Series, and you got the get to the show, and you hit. He uh, Porcello ended up winning a Cy Young, right? Year last year, year before. Oh, yeah. So you got your first hit off a Cy Young winner. I mean, geez, Louise, what else do they want? And your college degree? Holy cow! Such a good example. This is follow this script. Yeah. <laughs> hey man, I'll tell you what. Um, getting a job after playing baseball was having actually the, being a, a, a professional baseball player that made it to the big leagues played into my hands so well. Like, like I was going up against other people that had you know masters in construction at, at, from like a top tier school. And and I didn't, but they didn't. I went to my interview. I don't think I talked about construction at all. We talked about baseball. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> that happens <laughs> often now too. I, it's probably like most of your conversations. How do you not? Yeah. Yeah. It, it it's worked out really really well in my career outside of baseball for sure. The other thing I wanted to ask. I know I'm gonna run out of time, but I did want to ask. You know. Talking about pro ball and, and Fresno State, how how close a bond are you with still with those guys that you played at Fresno State with? Maybe even versus guys you played. Oh uh, yeah. So pro ball, I I have not really stayed in touch with anybody really. Um, maybe a, a couple of guys on Facebook. Um, but but yeah, Fresno State, we go back every year. And uh, and go to the alumni game, and and those friendships are are super close for sure. And then we try to get together one time outside of the alumni game um, with everybody and their families. It's such a such a close bond, so different than than for for pro ball relationships for me. Yeah, that's just it's just college's team, you know, team. So you have that brotherhood. Pro ball, pro ball is not like that until. And you you're kind in of, the big leagues for a while, maybe. Yeah, and you do you stay together with those guys. You're, you know, pretty tight with, with pro ball guys up and down, and your team can change <clears throat> any given day. Yeah. But anything uh, – Yeah, for sure. You got out there for these, these young guys, man, that just, you know, think that everything's just going to, you know, happen, you know, rather than, I guess, uh, going out and working for it. I know you're a hard worker and stuff, but – you know, what's one thing you could probably – I mean, you've said it, but if a guy's listening, you know, that wants to play at the next level and be a Division One baseball player and play professionally, um, you know, what would you tell him? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much what I was saying is I, I was not the guy that was a high recruit out of high school, you know, I, I, I was someone that I think was lucky to go to Fresno State, was lucky to right place at the right time, played out of my shoes, and uh, got to go to Fresno State. But the only reason I got there was all the time I spent in the cage. And the only reason why I excelled past Fresno State was being, being the first one in and the last one out and just living in the batting cage and taking more swings than everybody else in the batting cage. And then into pro ball, outside of that, analyzing pitchers. I, I would keep a – I'd keep a book. I'd keep my own scouting report book um, of all, all the pitchers that I faced. Because you face those guys a lot throughout your career, and, uh, and you forget about them. 
And so I, I would, you know, take it even to that level. Like I, I, I want to get to the big league so bad. I, I'm going to, I would take notes on on pitchers. What do they throw? What are their velocities? What are their out pitches? What are their, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? So when I face them another time, I'd be ready and I wouldn't be learning them all over again. Um, just, just you, you can really do anything you set your mind to. And, and there's physical limits, you know what I mean? But I don't think okay. I, I don't think I was six five and two twenty five. You know what I mean? Six foot one ninety five, and uh, just wanted it. And if you want it, and you're willing to put the work into it, you, you could you could get there. You know what I mean? Um, that that's the biggest thing I would say. And then outside of that, the high school kids go to college. College baseball is so much fun. It's so much more fun than professional baseball, at least for me go to college and when you're at college get your degree outside of baseball i mean i hope you make it to the big leagues but if you don't take it serious and get your degree when you're in college and and uh it'll help you later on in life for sure true yeah man it's it's right on the money right on the money man thank you for doing this um Anytime we can talk to Fresno State alumni, we want to, and, and definitely guys that get to the show and can provide, you know, not just information, but their experience uh, through college and pro ball. And, and, you know, not everybody's the same. And, and that's one of the, the you know, great call-up stories. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's – I think kids, you know, can see themselves in those situations. And that's what we want. We want them to think they can get there, uh, like you said, because they can if they put the work in. So – uh steve i appreciate you doing this and uh you got anything else no that's great stuff and i'm you know thankful you uh wanted to get on and and uh do the show with us yeah and i appreciate it i love the show keep it going otherwise there's gonna be some lonely drives for me to work (laughs) (laughs) keep it going i love it i love everything you guys are doing no, we appreciate that. That's uh, that's episode sixty nine of the Hit or Die podcast. Hit or die. <laughs>